I'm going to talk about some things that will probably be um, review topics for, for you guys, for some of you people. Hopefully it's not new for a lot of people who've, who've been farming. You know, I'm going to talk things um, about what nutrients are important for plant uh, fruit crops, what um, the importance of liming. Again, then we'll get in talking about sufficiency tables, about how do you know uh, when your plant has the correct amount of nutrients. Um, we'll talk about the different products that we use to apply both to the ground and then get into some of the foliar um, products that we can apply, uh, the correct time of sampling, how we sample. And then um, um, we're going to have a test. You all got that memo, right, that, that you're not going to be able to leave this room until you pass this test, okay, and you have to have 100% in order to, to leave the room. Um, I'm joking about the test, but I do have an exercise uh, at the end of the talk that we're going to kind of go through. I'm going to show you some soil and, and leaf analysis results and the crop, and we're going to kind of determine what, um, how to interpret those results. Okay, so um, you won't be graded on it, and again, you don't have to... Uh, to, to get 100% in order to, to leave the room. I was, I was kidding about that. Uh, so anyway, um, so what are we will be talking about? Of course, how do we know um, what, what's important um, or what the crop needs? And of course, I, I mentioned the sufficiency tables, and I'll be showing you some examples of those. Uh, they've been um, developed from years of university and independent research, um, primarily driven by the industry. Um, because obviously if you're selling apples or, or peaches and, and there's some nutrient deficiencies, the, the product isn't going to be good for the consumers. And, and so anyway, so um, these are tables that have been developed. And it's a continuing process because as new varieties come out, their needs may be different um, and, and, and so forth. Um, of course, we use soil tests and leaf analysis to determine those, um, what the crop needs. And, um, and of course, what, what we like to call the eye test is, you know, how well does the plant actually look when, when you look at it? You know, is it making the correct amount of, of um, vegetative growth that we would expect to keep the tree productive? Um, what is the color of the leaves? Okay, these are things you can visually, visually see. What's the cropping history? You know, has it been low cropping the past couple of years? Has, has it been overcropping, which would affect the nutrient uh, um, use of the plant? Um, what's the color of the fruit? I mean, is our nice red gala sport not really as red as you, you had hoped that it, you know, that it should be or what the pictures in the nursery catalogs look like? You know, and that could all be nutrient related. Of course, what are some um, internal issues that could be developed? And, um, and of course, even at harvest, you know, they may look fine internally, but then you put them in storage for, and you pull them out in three or four weeks or eight or 12 weeks. and. Uh, you got some problems, you know, going. So these are all things that we can see without running any of the other tests, um, and it's, it's important to, and to still use those even when we when we do uh, run all these other analyses. And then past experience. I mean, you know, you've been growing, you know, fruit for 20 years at this site, and 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 most of the recommendations call for putting most of the nitrogen down once once the fruit sets. So usually. By the end of May, you know, you pretty much know if you're going to be carrying a crop or not. Well, I know that if I put all my nitrogen down by May and we get 10 inches of rain in June, that nitrogen is going to be gone. So, you know, that's what past experience tells us. So, you know, you as a grower, you know what your soil type is like on your farm. And um, so, again, we rely on all these things to determine what the, uh, what the crop actually needs. <clears throat> so what are we talking about? Um, we're talking about what they term macronutrients. Okay, they are the major elements and the ones that we, we hear about most of the time, regardless of what crop you're, you're growing, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium are probably the ones that we're most um, interested in. And those are usually used in, uh, plants require those in larger amounts, which is why we call them macronutrients. And when you do leaf analysis, the results are usually expressed in percentage of dry weight. Um, soil analysis usually come back in pounds um, per acre. And in contrast to the micronutrients, which doesn't mean that they're any less important, it's just that I mean, the plant uses them in smaller amounts. And the, the micronutrients nutrients that we're mostly interested in are iron, uh, mag manganese, boron, copper, zinc. And again, they're needed in smaller quantities. And normally, the soil and leaf um, analysis results are given in parts per million. And I believe that the reason that is is because you're looking at the results are in a whole number, meaning it's not a decimal, it's not like a 0.0001 percent, and, and that's about what they would be if they were actually presented in a percentage as opposed to a, uh, 
a parts per million. So it just makes, I think it makes it easier for us to look at and actually understand what those numbers mean when it's a whole, a whole number. And then, of course, pH. Now, pH is not a nutrient. Okay, pH actually stands for potential hydrogen. Um, it's a measurement of this acidity in the soil. Um, so it's not a nutrient, but it's extremely important to how available the nutrients are in the soil to the plant. And we're going to spend a little bit of time um, talking about pH. Okay, if you've ever attended a, uh, or ever took a soils class, or you've, 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 see, you've participated in another workshop where we're talking about nutrient management, um, you've probably seen a table such as this. This basically is the relationship between uh, soil pH, which here is the scale along the bottom. Now, this is an abbreviated pH scale. The actual scale runs from 0 to 14. Uh, but for, for all intent purposes for plant use, um, we're, gonna, we're not concerned with everything, anything below 4, or certainly not above 10, or that could even be less than, than 10. But so we're, that's the, the reason why that scale is just from 4 uh, to 10. Now, each horizontal line. Um, represents each of the nutrients, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and so forth going down. So um, as the line is at its thickest, like right here, that means it's most available to the plants at this certain pH. Okay. Now I put this box here, which represents between 6 and 7, and you can see it basically covers every, uh, or all the nutrients at least on this particular um, graph here. And we can expect that most of these nutrients would be available between the pHs of 6 and 7. Um, normally, we shoot for a target uh, pH of about 6.5. So, you know, that, and that's a good, a good target for the majority of deciduous fruit crops that we grow um, around here. Now, there is one crop, that, um, fruit crop, that we grow that does not like pH up around there. Does anyone know what crop that is? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay, that likes it around five, four and a half to five. And I didn't put a box up there, but you can see even at five, it, it hits every, every nutrient. Okay, so it might not hit the best. It might not be the most ideal uh, pH to absorb all of our macronutrients, but it's enough that it does allow them to absorb them. And, and most of the time at that pH, we still do get enough of those elements in there. What we do see is that it's, it's, it makes, it's right in the range where most of the micronutrients are available. So in a nutshell, we see over here that higher pHs, if you let that pH get above 7 or her higher, that you're going to have, it favors more problems with the micronutrients, because you can see this line starts getting narrower as we get into the higher pHs for the most part. And that when we get into lower pH problems, like if we were to be growing blueberries and we overshoot our pH and go down to 4, it starts limiting the macronutrients. Okay, so that's just something to keep, keep in, in, in the back of your mind when we're working about working with uh, pH adjustments. So lime, okay, so lime, that's the great uh, product that we use to raise, to, to, uh, to change the acidity of the soil, raise the, the pH. Um, calcium carbonate, which is the chief component of limestone, is what we use to raise the pH around here. Um, if you're going to lower the pH, you would use sulfur. That's all I'm going to say about lowering the pH, because we're, we're more interested in the most part, um, most of the time, of raising the pH. And um, it's the most widely used amendment to, to uh, adjust the acidity in the soil. Um, it can also supply significant amounts of calcium. And depending on the source of your lime, it can also contribute a significant amount of magnesium. So that's a, three, a, a winner three times around. We're raising our pH with lime, and we're supplying significant amounts of calcium and magnesium. Now, the majority of the time, you're going to be applying uh, one of two types of lime. One is, is uh, calcic lime, excuse me, um, which is, again, standard limestone. It's, it's usually low in, in magnesium content. And the second type is dolomitic lime. And that's a, a, um, a calcium plus magnesium uh, product. Uh, usually, the magnesium content of a dolomitic lime will be between 2 and 13%. Um, you still get some magnesium in the calcic limestone, but it's not as great as uh, what you find in dolomite. There are a couple other sources um, of lime that you can rate, that you, you can use to raise the, uh, the pH, which would be like hydrated lime, slack lime, burnt lime. Uh, very reactive with the soil, can change the pH fairly quickly. Um, in fact, you have to be very careful that you don't overshoot the pH that you're trying to get with this quick or burnt lime. Um, it, it can be used, but again, it, it's, 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 you can raise the pH so quickly, it can, can literally burn, burn your plant. So it is something that's available, but I think in most cases, um, we will be using either calcic lime or, or dolomitic lime. 
Okay. Well, um, what should we be looking for when we buy lime? If you're calling your lime supplier or you want to compare prices and you're going to call vendor A, vendor B, and vendor C, you shouldn't just be going, hey, how much is a ton of lime? And accept that as, 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 and, and compare the, the value of the lime. What you really need to look at is right here, which is called the calcium carbonate equivalent, or CCE. This particular product, 97%, that's the, the, the quality of the limestone. Okay, that's a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good rate. I mean, you know, we figure 100%. I mean, we're at 97%, so this is a pretty pure uh, source of lime. So when you're called comparing lime, you don't just want to say, hey, how much is a ton of lime? You want to say, well, what's the calcium carbonate equivalent? I mean, you can, you can get values. Now, we're in a good part of the country. A lot of good limestone comes out of Pennsylvania, uh, usually pretty good quality. But you can get some uh, CCEs down around 50 or 60%. So again, you really want to be buying it based on your CCE content. Now, second thing you want to look at, and if I understand correctly, not every state requires um, that they actually list what the effective neutralizing value is. Okay, what that is now, when you get your soil test back and you look at it, it's 5.5. Oh man, I really got to raise my pH. Um, you want it to, to happen fairly quickly. Now, in, in liming world of quickly, that's anywhere from six months, six months to 12 months. Okay, so that's fast than lime, lime, lime years, I guess. Um, so you want to look at that, and basically that is determined by how fine the lime is ground. Okay, this particular bag of lime that, this, that I took this picture from actually lists what the grade. So 100 mesh is a very fine screen, and we can see that 72% of this material will go through a 100 mesh screen. So that's a pretty good quality product. Um, 20 mesh, you would hope everything's going to go through because that's a pretty, pretty big hole. Um, so if you can imagine limestone is mined as a rock, you know, and if you were to, uh, to try to put that through your screens, you know, you might be able to get it, get it through an eight mesh screen. I don't know, but it's not much surface area to a whole stone. But once you crush that stone and now you have thousands of, of little particles, um, it's a much finer grind, it's much faster to react because these limes have to react um, with the soil particles, okay? So the way that they actually determine the effect of neutralizing value, um, and there's actually a link that I give in the resource uh, page in your book that actually goes to a University of Maryland nutrient management page that actually tells you how to actually, if you want to calculate it yourself. But it's basically, you're looking at what the percentage is that goes to a 20 mesh screen, what goes to a 60 mesh screen, they combine those together, they multiply that by your CCE, and that's how they come up with an effective liming, a liming value. So two important points to, uh, to consider when you're buying lime, okay? Uh, so how much lime do I need to, uh, to raise the pH of my soil? And this is a table. It's pretty common. We see, it, we see it in a lot of places. In fact, I think this is out of uh, University of Maryland um, Nutrient Management um, Manual. And um, basically, um, this particular chart is assuming that the CCE is 100%. Okay, I don't have that up there, but that's basically what they're assuming. Since average was 97%, you basically divide 97 into 100 and you get 1.02. So instead of one ton of lime at 100%, you would have to put uh, 2,080 pounds of lime to be equivalent to a, to a ton of lime because it's not a pure 100% product. Okay. So anyway, so it's all about soil texture. You can see here um, we have the different types of, of soil. Um, just break these loamy sand up to a silt loam. Uh, if we want to, if our soil pH happens to be around four, and we want to raise it to our target rate of 6.5 for loamy sand. It's going to take two and a quarter ton of 100% CCE lime to raise that to that point. But if you go over, if you have a silt loam, it's going to take almost six tons of lime. Okay. So it's very important that you know your soil texture so you know how much lime you're going to need. Because one thing you don't want to do is to put six tons of lime on your loamy sand soil. Okay. Um, so it's a good thing that you say, hey, well, it's, it's not going to cost me as much to raise the pH of my loamy sand, and that is true. Um, however, your loamy sand is also going to lose that liming effect faster than your silt loam, which means when it rains a lot, it's going to decrease the pH. When you start using our fertilizers, which are acidifying agents most of the time, um, so you're gonna, you can raise the pH faster with less material on sands, but it's also going to lose that, that pH as well. So again, this is a very important thing that you know your soil texture and, and, uh, before you, you start applying your lime. Okay? 
Okay, so um, that's about all I'm going to say about liming. Okay, so now the question is, well, how do we measure the nutrient contents in the soil and in the trees? Okay, well, we have two, two ways that we can do that um, to actually get a, get a number. You know, as opposed to the eye test, you know, we actually want a number. Well, unlike, unlike soil tests, which basically are just telling us what's in the soil, um, leaf analysis tells us what the plant is actually absorbing. So you can think about the soil as being kind of like a bank of nutrients and the soil is going to remove some of those and get up into the tree. So they kind of work in tandem to a certain extent. Soil sampling still has its place, though. If you're establishing an orchard um, two years before you're ready to plant, three years ready, you know, ready to plant your orchard or fruit planting, you want to go out there and do your soil sampling. You want to be able to adjust your pH before you plant in the trees. Um, you're never going to have a better time to get those nutrients into the soil um, before the, the crop is planted. Okay, you can, you can do some deep, deep tillage to get that lime down and to try to get it as far down into the profile as you can. Um, um, of course, during the, the life of an established orchard, the main purpose of soil sampling is for pH monitoring. The pH is going to change through the, the lifetime of the orchard. You're going to need to um, apply lime at some point, and the only way you're going to know is, is to, to uh, do soil sampling to, to monitor that pH. And uh, soil sampling really is not a very accurate way of measuring nitrogen in the soil, and sometimes it can be a little tricky actually measuring micronutrients through, um, through soil sampling. Now, leaf sampling, like I said up in the top, it is a way of, of actually determining how much the plant is absorbing. It's a great, most accurate method of determining the, the status, the nutrient status of your plant. It's kind of like a snapshot. Um, it's a diagnostic tool for um, determining abnormalities. In fact, a lot of times, um, people never even do leaf sampling until they have a problem, and then they want to know, you know what's going on. And again, if we do it regularly and over a course of several years, we can kind of monitor the um, nutritional level of the plants, and it kind of lets us know of an impending deficiency, and we can get on it before we actually have a problem. So um, they both kind of work in tandem, um, and we should think about that way. Okay, so again, we lime the field, um, and we want to put down some of the other important nutrients based on our soil test. Now, this table is directly out of the uh, University of Maryland uh, Nutrient Management um, book, and um, this is just basically pertaining to two of our uh, macronutrients, uh, phosphorus and potassium. Now, we've, they've made it really easy to, to read soil tests, basically. When you submit a soil test now, you'll get not only um, pounds per acre of what nutrients um, are required, but it'll tell you by the um, fertilizer index value whether you're low, medium, optimum, or excessive, and based on a scale of 1 to 100 for low, medium, and optimum. So, you know, 0 to 25 is low. 26 to 50 is medium, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of easy thing to do. You get your soil test back. It says, hey, I got medium for phosphorus and potassium. Recommendations are 90 pounds of phosphorus, 130 for potassium. Um, and if you want to use more common products like triple, <laughs> triple uh, uh, phosphate um, or potash for your potassium, this tells you how much I need to put down, to about 200 pounds of the, of the phosphorus product and a little over 200 pounds of the uh, potassium products. Very easy, easy to read. Again, you want to do it before you plant the trees because, again, it gives you a great opportunity to uh, work it into the ground. Um, I will routinely, um, boron is, is inherently low in Maryland soils. You've, if you've done soil tests, you, you've probably seen that. So I will routinely get my fertilizer dealer to blend in two pounds of boron with my um, um, phosphorus and potassium, one of the two products that I'm going to apply. Easy way to get it into the soil. Again, great for working it down. Okay, so um, we've done our liming before we plant the orchard. We, we've got a couple of our major elements up, up to snuff by you know, pre-plant you know, soil testing and put them in the ground. So then when we plant our, uh, our uh, trees or, or, or fruit bushes, um, basically the first two or three years, we, we really should only have to apply nitrogen at that point. Okay? And um, this is a table, again, it's been around for a long time. It's general recommendations on a per plant basis, hand applied around the, on the individual plant that you're planting. Um, they're listing just three products, calcium uh, or ammonia nitrate or ammonia sulfate. Um, why do you think that we, they list only ammonia sulfate for the blueberries? <coughs> there you go. Uh, sulfate should be a clue. I mentioned sulfur is, used, is a product that we use for lowering the pH. Blueberries like a low pH, so it, it makes sense to try to use a product that will help keep the, the pH low. Um, there's no reason why you couldn't use it on the other, other uh, crops, but again, we don't want to lower the pH in any crop other than 
and uh, again, in, uh, except for blueberries. A lot of people like to use calcium nitrate because it has that calcium component. Calcium is notoriously deficient in a lot of fruit crops, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Um, so a lot of people like to use calcium nitrate. Um, but, but basically, any nitrogen product would probably suffice. It's just that these, you know, you want to get a, a tree up and growing, and these are, seem to be a three uh, more popular products that uh, people use. So even after the first three years, a lot of people aren't doing tissue analysis. You know, how are you going to tell whether you, you, know, you have enough nitrogen you know, when the plants are having enough nitrogen? And again, it goes back to that eye test that I talked about. And here, I'd actually list the desired shoot length. So for peaches, uh, for instance, Recommended that you get, you know, you have a foot and foot and a half to two feet of annual growth each year. Um, if you're getting that, leaves look you know, nicely colored, then you're probably doing right by um, putting down that 65 pounds of, uh, of nitrogen in the acre. Again, that's just a rough estimate. It's going to vary by what your your planting density is. Um, but again, if you're still resistant to do um, foliar analysis, again, you have to you have to go by something. So you're going to start using that eye test for that. Okay. Uh, so here are some of the fertilizer products that are, um, we use for ground application. It's not an exhaustive list. What you won't see here is anything listed like a 10-10-10 or a 20-20-20, the blends that are common. You commonly can go into a garden supply store or any uh, farm store and buy you know, off, the, off the shelf, I guess. Um, but again, unless you actually need that analysis, I mean, maybe you're, you're going to apply that so you get your nitrogen. Well, you're, you may be over applying your phosphorus if you go with a 10-10-10 or 20 20 20 or, or something like that. So it's something you really have to look at because you may be wasting your money by applying a product like that if you don't actually need all those uh, elements um, at that time. Um, so you, again, you see some that are, uh, they're actually combinations. I mentioned calcium nitrate, potassium nitrate. Uh, you know, so you're not only getting nitrogen, you're getting some of the other elements as well. Uh, same thing with some of the phosphorus products, um, monomonium phosphate, you know, you're getting um, some, some nitrogen as well as phosphorus. So you got to take all that into, into consideration. Um, if you only need calcium and, uh, or magnesium, and, or I'm sorry, calcium and maybe sulfur. Gypsum is a good product that's out there now and it seems to be becoming uh, more available because of, um, uh, they, they've put scrubbers in the coal burning power plants now. So instead of all the sulfur being spewed across the landscape, they're, they're collecting it and actually trying to sell it to agricultural producers as a, a gypsum product. Gypsum is also mined um, and also sheetrock is a, a byproduct. So you might see a lot of vendors out there now selling gypsum as a calcium and sulfur source and, and it is a very good source. What it does not do, it does, it's not a liming product. Okay, It's not going to change your pH unless for somehow they mix it with limestone, which I haven't seen. But I did notice, and just as an aside, um, MDA um, puts out a, uh, I guess if you're selling products in the state, you have to register with, with the MDA. And I, I went to their list just the other day, the 2016 list, and the heading of it was liming products, and it lists all the vendors, and it says what the product is, and it gives calcium and magnesium. They actually had gypsum there as a liming product. I don't, don't know why that is, but gypsum is not a liming product. Good source of calcium and sulfur, but doesn't do anything for the pH other than maybe lower the pH, possibly. But, but it's certainly not, it doesn't raise, raise the pH. So again, this is just a list of some of the products that we use. And some of these actually are the same ones that we use for foliar um, applications. Um, but again, it's always important to read the label with, with anything that you buy. Make sure it's the proper uh, material that's going to do what you're actually looking for. Uh, okay, so we got the trees are grown, we did all the pre-plan, we got it off the snuff, we did the hand applications, you know, when the trees are young. So how do we get the nutrients to the trees when the established orchard, okay? Well, one possibility, although it's, it's not highly recommended, this is uh, hard to see, but it's actually a spin spreader. Okay, it's where it spins the fertilizer, lime basically all behind the tractor to the left, to the right, and the center. So if you um, have a sod alleyway, which we highly recommend with fruit plantings, um, there's a possibility you could use materials to fertilize the sod in addition to the uh, tree crop. Not really recommend it. You're probably going to either underdose the trees or over apply it to the sod in order to do that. Uh, you might be able to get away with it once every couple of years and you still may wind up having to supplement uh, some nutrients onto the tree row. Um, the only instance that I could see maybe for really using a spreader 
is if you're applying lime, because you need to get the lime under the tree as in addition to the sod alley way. Now, if you're not growing a sod alley, and if you're just letting whatever grows weeds, um, you're wasting money. I mean, I don't want to fertilize my weeds. Um, so anyway, so uh, again, that's not really a recommended way to do it, but you may be able to find a way that it could work for you. But again, calibration of the spreader, making sure it's putting out the amount that, that you want and it's applying it where it, where it needs it is, is very important. Um, what is recommended, though, is to manage the side alleyway separate from the tree row. Okay, and again, it might be hard to see, but that is a herbicide strip underneath of the, uh, uh, underneath of the trees. You would manage the side strip with a drop spreader, not a spin spreader, so the material just drops right to the ground. Um, you can get one that fits the size of your, of your grass alleyways. You can always block off some of the spouts underneath it. That's really the best way to manage a side alley. Um, and an orchard combined is to manage them separately. If you don't fertilize your side alleyways, broadleaf weeds are going to wind up creeping in. Usually clovers are first, so you have to fertilize your side alleyways in order to keep them productive and, and do what they're intended to do, smother out the broadleaf weeds, you know, not, not allow them to go. Now, there are um, some side, what they call, or what I call side slinging um, broadcast spreaders. They, they will only apply it to one side. And if you, again, adjust them to that it's actually going to cover the, the herbicide strip, I think there are a lot of people using those that have larger you know, operations. And of course, there's always the old hand apply method, putting it around the base of the tree. Uh, I kind of, you know, it's, it's okay for nitrogen, and you might get away with some of the macro elements because it's, it's a, you'd be applying a larger volume. But when you're trying to do some of those micronutrients where the rate might be five pounds to the acre, how are you going to evenly apply it, that around your trees? You know, again, you can get it blended into some fertilizers, um, but it's very difficult to, to get an, an actual even application. One way that I didn't, method that I, I, I've neglected to put up there was the use of um, herbicide sprayers. You know, you have a side boom close to the ground that you're going to be applying your herbicides. Um, ride down each side of the road to put the herbicide strip down. It is okay to put some of these nutrients, assuming they're water soluble, um, and some are actually um, can be put down at the same time you do your herbicide sprays. Uh, again, always read the label to make sure that that's um, an acceptable method. Okay. Uh, so over applying nutrients. Holy cow! Can you read that? I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, there's a lot of. I mean, you, if you think you have problems by under applying nutrients, try working with crops that you over apply nutrients with. Uh, over applying nitrogen, you get poor fruit color, poor um, under color. You know, the, the the side that should be yellow. If you have a red fruit, there might be yellow. It may never turn yellow. Delayed fruit maturity, soft fruit with some of the pome fruits and berries. And again, you can read the whole host of uh, problems that, that, that we can have by over applying some of our, our, our nutrients. Um, one in particular, and I didn't mention it about lime, is that um, um, uh, magnesium, okay? Uh, if you over apply magnesium, you can reduce calcium uptake. So if your soil tests come back with optimum or above magnesium levels, you do not want to use dolomitic lime, okay? If you recall, that is the high magnesium product. Uh, you better stick with the high calcium or the calcic, the calcic problem, okay? So I just wanted to point that out about liming and, and, and which lime to choose. So, so anyway, you can read that. In addition to um, um, some other things, there's, there's been some more information coming out lately lately, the past you know, 10 or 20 years, uh, about the ratios of nitrogen to potassium, phosphorus to zinc ratios, nitrogen to sulfur ratios, potassium to magnesium. Um, you know, and and I, I drew a lot of this information for small fruits out of the Mid-Atlantic Berry Guide, and I actually refer you to that publication for a little bit more detail. It's a little bit more than I, I felt like I, need, I had time to talk about in this this type of venue. Uh, but there is a, a balance that you really need. And if you don't keep an eye on that balance, you can, you can uh, make certain elements unavailable to the, to the tree by over applying certain nutrients. So again, you should really read up a little bit about that if you happen to be growing strawberries or brambles. OK, foliar fertilizers. Fertilizers can be applied um, to fruit trees. Um, as nutrient sprays. Um, of course, you know, there's only so many leaves on a tree and the leaves are only so big, so there's only a limited amount of surface area that the plants can actually absorb these nutrients. Okay, so um, 
you know, over the course of many years, universities have come up with the optimum time to apply these certain elements and, um, they, they, and you know, for, for overcoming um, possibly or preventing certain mineral deficiencies or enhanced tree performance. However, as it says there, caution, nutrient sprays can be very, uh, can cause severe injury to fruit, to leaves, to shoots and buds. Um, you really don't want to apply them unless, unless there's a known deficiency, either through uh, foliar analysis or if you're so um, versed in, in the different nutritional deficiencies that you can tell by the eye test. Um, use a dilute spray as often as possible. You, you kind of don't want to, I mean, a lot of pesticides are sprayed at a concentrated rate. Um, nutrients, it's really not recommended that those be used at a concentrated rate because uh, they can cause very se severe injury. So you got kind of really need to know what you're doing if you're deciding to go the uh, foliar fertilizing route. I was looking as I was putting this talk together, I was looking to see what the most current research was and everything. And actually out in California, they did a sand tank test. And actually sand um, pot tanks um, or tests or what they use with annual plants. You know, they can do it in pots where they uh, fill the pot up with sand, they put the annual plant in and they add the nutrients that they want to investigate or, or eliminate some, some of the nutrients and they, they can, can cause uh, the deficiencies to show up and, and everything. So, but they basically did this with, um, with peach trees. They dug these huge holes, lined them like a big, with a big pot, filled it with sand and then planted the tree um, and then um, added um, whatever nutrients they wanted to add. Usually, you know, they would have one with a complete um, complement of nutrients and then you know, each tree down the line, this one, they, they eliminated the iron, the phosphorus, the potassium down the line. So aside from getting a nice uh, a color uh, photographs from this, this study, two of the, um, not the main conclusions, but a, a general um, conclusion that, that they had made that, that if any individual nutrients drops into the efficiency level, that um, somehow the tree is going to respond either through fruit si your lack of fruit size, shoot growth is going to be compromised, or nutritional problems within the fruit. And chances of, of fruit disorder, disorders will be increased. And that's with any, if they eliminate any. So that just tells us that th the nutrients that we, th that, we, uh, that, that we know that the plant needs, indeed they do need them. Okay. And that the deficiency, that if a deficiency occurs, it doesn't always show as a leaf symptom. Okay, which just emphasizes the importance of doing foliar analysis. Uh, maybe not every year, but certainly every couple of years. Okay, because um, once you wait until you see the deficiency, it becomes harder to, to correct. So if you can see an impending deficiency coming, you, know, you can start to, to be proactive with trying to keep it from becoming a full-blown problem. Okay. Okay, so when and how do I collect leaf samples for analysis? For most fruit crops, it's been determined through years of research that the best time to collect leaf samples is between July 15th and August 15th for all the deciduous type fruits that we grow in our, in our area of the world. Okay, and the reason that is is because they've determined that, that was the plants are most stable, okay, and that we get the best um, um, results or we can, we can make recommendations on the results that we get based if we took them earlier in the year or later in the year. So that's the best time to take, to take those shoots. You want to avoid contamination because, of course, you're spraying uh, some of the materials that we spray, actually, um, in, in, in the case of Maneb or something, they have manganese and zinc uh, included in those products. So you want to try to do it at the end of a spray cycle. If, you're, if your plan is to spray tomorrow, you want to do your leaf samples today to avoid any contamination or unusual results that you don't, you know, um, un unexpected results based on some contamination. Um, you want to sample at least 50 healthy leaves, and that would be from a crop that the leaves are larger. With blueberries, you probably want to you know, harvest maybe some more like 75 or 100 leaves. You always want to try to do it from plants that are the same age, because younger trees will usually have higher um, nitrogen in, in the plant just because it's a smaller tree than, than older trees. You want to stick with the same varieties. You don't want to intermingle varieties. You have several varieties of, of blueberries. You don't want to combine those varieties. Uh, you want to do it individual by variety. Um, if you have different rootstocks in your trees, uh, you want to try to stick with the same rootstock, same variety. Kind of you know, get everything from the same because it really complicates trying to sort out the, sort out the, uh, uh, the results if, if you have everything uh, kind of combined together. Um, so again, and one of the things to do, if you have, so say if you've got 12 varieties of apples you're growing and, 
and you know, hey, I, I mean, 25 bucks a pop for these uh, leaf analysis, you know, maybe you don't want to put out that each year. So you, know, you split it up, like I'll do four this year, four next year, four to third year. Again, you keep your records and you can kind of follow it. Uh, Maryland nutrient management regulations require us as growers to soil or at leaf analysis once every three years. Okay, so you're kind of going to have to do something once every three years, so you know, maybe you can split it up. And, and, and manage that like that. You know, you want to just like soil sampling where we try to determine management blocks. You know, I mean, if there's a great uh, change in the terrain, you know, if you get a, a bottom and then, you know, you have a hillside, you don't want to really combine those soil samples. You want to have a management area of maybe the hill and then your bottom would be another management area. Same thing with fruit trees. I mean, here on the shore, we're pretty, pretty flat and, you know, we, we may get changes of soil. Uh, I know on the western shore, you know, you get rolling hills. So you kind of look at them as Management blocks, you want to sample, make them like management units, I guess is a good term that they, they use for that. Um, so um, you want to try to do it the same, uh, I won't say the same time because years change, you know, you get an early year, things are um, ripening sooner, later year. Um, so you don't really want to, you can kind of use the calendar as, hey, this is when I'm going out, but just realize that things, you know, particularly for some. Um, some, some of the fruit crops that, um, that things could be advanced in maturity sooner than, than we would expect. So again, uh, you want to be cognizant of, of the, the timing that you uh, um, sample. And of course, they like, they always recommend um, picking, if this is your annual growth here, and this is where it was attached to a limb, so this would be the basal portion, this would be the the growing tip or, you know, or terminal. Uh, you want to sample for, sample for somewhere in the, um, in the, the middle of that, uh, of that shoot. Uh, you want to select only um, two leaves per shoot. Um, you want to maybe go around the tree. I mean, some people may use what they call like indicator trees. These are the trees I'm going to sample every year. You know, they might have you know five or six trees throughout their eight, you know throughout their block of, of, of uh, similar varieties, similar rootstocks, and everything. Um, try to do it at the same time. If you're going to walk around, hey, I'm going to only sample leaves that are at shoulder, shoulder height as I walk around the tree. Um, but try to do things consistently so you can build a, a reliable you know, um, database that you can have, you can go back to and, and look at. Um, so if you get something that's out of whack one year, was it because of poor sampling? Um, or is it really what, what's, what's going on with the tree? So if you have a plant that has suspicious looking leaves, and again, this is usually why people will start you know, being interested in fuller analysis, you need to keep those separate from the healthy trees. Okay, you may want to send two sets in. Well, this was from my healthy tree that was two rows over, and for some reason, this, these three or four trees in this row look you know, funky. So you want to send maybe two sets in, send the funky leaves in and send the, the, the ones that you think are, are healthy. Okay, it gives you something to compare against. If you've never sent in a, a foliar leaf analysis, for, you know, um, for, for analysis, this, is, uh, this could be a type of result that you get. This is one that I did from through Penn State uh, for a number of years ago, and I haven't done one recently. I, I, when I get them for our research plots, I normally just get them to send me the numbers, you know, and I, I rarely get this uh, graphic there. Although I think looking, getting a graphic like that kind of I think really, you can kind of look at things a little bit easier, at least in my mind, and, and actually see the differences. And of course, they have it listed by, you know, down here would be deficient, um, low, of course, normal would be when the, the bars come across here, and, and so forth. And what you get when you send these in, whether it's Penn State or, or well, it used to be a &L Labs, now it's Waypoint, and now we have a new one, AgroLab, over in Delaware, um, and there's probably a few more over on the Western Shore that you guys may use, is they all will give you recommendations, okay, which is great. And it starts down here. Now, this one, only because nitrogen was the first one on the list, if I had copied the, the flip side, it would have gave me all the other elements here. But it gives you a recommendation. It tells you what the normal range is. Um, so you can kind of see, well, am I kind of like at the, this, the barely you know, low or if I'm extremely out of whack or something? And, it, and again, it goes to a, a basic recommendation. Um, and, and it'll do that for all the elements that they, uh, that they measure for. This is one of these efficiency tables that I talked about. And this one actually, um, it has all the major tree fruits that we, that we grow around here. And these are only giving you the actual sufficiency. This is where we want to see the ranges when we send our, in our leaf samples. This is, what we want, this is what we're shooting for from this range for apricots, nitrogen 2 to 2.5%. 2 
okay? Um, and you go right down the line. Um, so that's the macronutrients are giving in percentages. When you get down to the micronutrients, again, these are in parts per million. You see these are whole numbers. I think they're a little easier to, to at least for my eye, to, 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 to understand than if it was something like 0 0.0002. Uh, you know, to 0.05 or something. So it's very good. And you can see here that there are some blank spots, you know, and they, the recommendations or, or, or they never, for years, um, until recently, they, they really, sulfur wasn't a concern. Plenty of sulfur coming down from the sky through the, from the smoke plants, smokestacks of the coal burning power plants. That's all changed. I mean, when they started putting the scrubbers on the stacks, we don't get that free sulfur anymore. So, um, so at the time this table was made, um, you know, we weren't interested in sulfur, and, and so, so there's probably new sufficiency tables out that might be starting to list, list sulfur. Same thing like with molybdenum. I mean, uh, it's, it's a, we know it's, it's important for crop. Um, we've never really thought that we've had issues with it, and, and so we've only seen people actually starting to develop these sufficiency um, amounts for, for specific uh, um, nutrients, okay? So again, that's something now if you would actually, you can see an expanded uh, table of these where they would actually, for, so instead of Apple just showing you sufficiency, they would show you what the deficiency ranges were as well as the um, excessive range would be so you would know where you would fill in those. And those, if you go to specific commodities, you would see those expanded sufficiency tables. And I did have a little asterisk next to the apple varieties, and of course they've had, I mean, apples and pears are probably the most studied fruit crops as far as nutrient um, sufficiency and nutrient um, management in those crops because they're the ones that we grow most acreage of in the United States. It's ones that, that we like to store. You know, we like to put them in cold storage or controlled atmosphere storage and have them hang around for a while so we can sell them in, in January and February and, you know, and, and, and so forth. So if we're already dealing with a soft variety, and, and one of the things that, that if you remember from the over application of nutrients is that um, it can make soft fruit. So if we already have a soft uh, cultivar, an apple that is soft anyway, we certainly don't want to make it any softer. So they've actually refined um, the sufficiency tables for varieties of apples that are, if they're soft variety, we're actually shooting for a lower nitrogen content than some of the, 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 the harder varieties of varieties um, that we use for processing all. So again, apples, because just they've been studied more that we see these coming out. Okay, and again, as time goes on, we may start seeing these more refined sufficiency tables for other commodities as well. Okay, this is sufficiency tables for a couple of the small fruits. Not too different um, than uh, what we see for the tree fruits. Again, sometimes, um, um, again, the spread may be a lot, a lot wider, like for instance down here. Iron and magnesium from 30 to 300. I mean, that's, that's pretty big a big spread as opposed to three to 15 parts per million. I mean, again, you know, it, it's, it's something that, 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 it's a number that you can use, so when you do your analysis, you can compare it to and see where you fall within, uh, whether you're doing a good job or a bad job of nutrient management. So these are some of the common foliar nutrient fertilizers that we, um, that we, um, that we use, okay? And some of them are on that list from the, uh, the ground applied fertilizers. Um, Again, uh, the normal rate per acre, okay, this isn't like per application, this is what we shoot for, for a course, a course uh, over the course of the whole season, okay? So for nitrogen and, and, um, and apples, you know, pink or petal fall is the time to apply that nitrogen, um, and that's using urea. Um, now there is, um, again, I, I think I might have mentioned when you go to buy nutrients, um, depending on where you buy them, you wanna always make sure that the label says a plant food, okay, for um, foliar application, okay. The internet um, it makes it easy to buy stuff from around the world if we want to, you know. Know your vendor, know the products that they're selling. Try to buy products that have been on the market for a long time. The reason they're still on the market is because they're working. You know, people haven't been having problems with them. Okay, so it really pays to know um, that you're getting a good product. Um, urea, um, it says the low berate, berate I'm, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Um, the berate form of urea is actually an animal feed supplement. <laughs> you don't want to use that to, as a foliar uh, fertilizer. And I suspect it's vice versa. You don't want to be feeding your animals the, the, uh, the, the, the low berate uh, type. So uh, be aware of that. And, um, 
Calcium chloride, again, another one that's commonly used, and actually it's used quite a bit in apples and pears to reduce um, cork spot um, in apples. Uh, so we're, we're applying anywhere from 50, 15 to 50 pounds per acre through uh, seven cover sprays. Uh, there is a construction grade calcium chloride, okay? Make sure when you pick up that bag, it says a plant food for foliar application, okay? So again, you can, you know, these are the timings that through university research, they've determined that this is the best time, this is the safest time, this is the safest way to apply these foliar nutrients um, to the tree to lessen the chances that you're gonna cause any burn or some unintended consequences of applying these fertilizers. And you can find a lot of times, and again, if you're, if you're deciding to go this route with um, foliar nutrients, again, you know, there are certain caveats about everything, zinc, do not apply with oils or within 30 days of an oil application. Now, it's saying to apply before growth starts, so you're kind of, you know, you're tied into getting into this, the same season that you're maybe applying oils, you know, dormant oils on your, your fruit tree, so you gotta be aware of that. Boron, do not exceed eight pounds per year. Now, that's whether you're applying it to the ground or whether you're applying it to the foliar, okay? So to each, each nutrient has a little bit of caveat. Magnesium. Foliar sprays are a temporary fix, okay? Where can we get magnesium from? Our lime, okay? It would be better if indeed your plant, if your soil needs to be limed and you are having magnesium problems to apply it to the ground. If you keep, I mean, maybe you want to apply these nutrients every year. I think if you're trying to, 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 to solve something, you know, I mean, that's not solving it if it's just a temporary fix. You know, I mean, it might be time after three or four years that, hey, maybe I gotta think about putting more magnesium on the ground. Okay, so they all have their little things, and again, by looking at information that's put out by the universities, it kind of lessens the chances that we're gonna make, make a mistake, okay? It's test time. <laughs> okay, what you're gonna see here are examples of a uh, soil test and a foliar analysis. Okay, soil analysis, full analysis, side by side for several small fruit crops. Okay, so what our job is going to be, and I'm, I'm going to, you know, all the information that the answers are, were all contained in the previous 30 minutes of running my mouth. Um, and um, so anyway, um, let's, let's take a look at the first one. Okay, this is an easy one, okay. So this was a, a perennial strawberry planting, okay. Uh, soil test for calcium and magnesium were low or medium. Soil or leaf tests came back as both being low. Okay, so low here, medium here, uh, both here low. pH 5.8. What do you think we recommended to this grower? There you go. Okay. Okay, recommendation one and a half ton of dolomitic lime because we wanted the magnesium to adjust the pH up and to add calcium and magnesium to the soil. That was an easy one, okay? Next one. Primocane raspberries, okay? If you might have heard Kelly mention if you don't grow raspberry, primocane raspberries are the kind that we cut off its soil level in the late winter. It grows vegetatively for several months, then it starts producing flowers, and then it fruits, and we're done with that, and we start to cycle all over again. Okay, potassium was high in the soil, but the leaf came back low. Okay, everything else looks relatively good, pH is good, and so, hmm. One thing about this year, this was back in 2012, it was a very early season for us that year. Okay, things started growing sooner in the spring, harvest was earlier that year. These are clues, okay? <laughs> okay, anybody? Okay. Well, um, what happened was the, the grower was sampling by the calendar. Uh, every year I go out on August 5th and I sample my leaves and, and I go in. Well, since this was an earlier year, these primary cane uh, raspberries were already fruiting at that time, or at least flower or you know, green fruit. They might not have been harvesting yet, but they were well on their way to you know, later than it, sh it should have been in the phenology stage of things. So basically, leaf samples were collected during fruiting. Developing fruit can draw potassium from the surrounding leaves into the fruit, giving you a lower leaf level. 
Okay, so there was no need to, oh, I gotta go out there and spray a potassium product on my leaves. No, that's, that's not true because soil uh, levels were high. Um, we figured that because of the sampling timing that that was a, um, just a fact of the, it was an improper time of leaf sampling. Okay, so that was the answer to that one. Another perennial strawberry question, okay. This was uh, potassium and calcium were high in the soil, but low in the leaf sample. Boron soil was medium, but gave us a low, a low um, leaf sample analysis. Okay. Now, perennial strawberries, I didn't mention this. Those are recommended to be sampled, foliar sampled, after renovation. If you don't, haven't never grown perennial strawberries, you know we plant them the first year in the spring. They grow vegetatively the first year. We don't fruit them the first year. The second year they come back, we harvest, and then we renovate the crop after harvest. Renovating meaning we, we mow off the leaves, we narrow the rows down, um, put down another shot of herbicide if we want, and, um, and sample the first mature trifoliate leaves that comes out of that new growth, because we, we mowed the leaves off. Okay, so that's when we sample. So that's somewhere around the end of June, maybe July, if, if you know, we're really lazy. Um, okay, so that's that. Well, this particular year, and I forget what year this was, it was a droughty year, okay? Rain stopped sometime in early June, okay? And I'm guilty of ignoring some, some crops after harvest, and you know, we've moved on to other, other, other chores. Um, irrigation is limiting, so maybe I wasn't watering my strawberries because the harvest was done as, as often as I should have been, particularly in a drought situation. Okay? Most nutrients require to be in a soil solution. Okay, they need water to become mobile in the soil. Okay? That's how the nutrients get to the roots. Secondly, Boron is responsible for growing tips, which means if you have a low boron situation, um, and I know it, it says medium in, in, in the soil, but it's, it's telling us low, is that it's possible that we were limiting root growth and it wasn't actually even to reach the boron that was in the soil. So after talking with the grower, and I mean, it was easy to see that it was a droughty situation, and, we did try, and he admitted that, uh, yeah, he hadn't, hadn't watered as much. Uh, that due to the uh, low water irrig insufficient irrigation, it limited nutrient supply to the roots. Low boron in the soil can limit the root growth ability to access the nutrients. So we basically um, told the grower to apply um, boron the next time that they applied their nutrients um, based on the, on the, on the, uh, the leaf analysis. Okay. Uh, blueberry. All right, here we go. Um, everything looks fairly good on the soil side, uh, pH 5.2. Um, iron level, iron was low, okay, but the, the soil analysis says it's high. Okay, blueberries, what do, what do we know about blueberries? What kind of pH do they like? There you go, that's exactly right. If you remember that uh, pH uh, kind of chart I showed you with the availability of nutrients, so there was plenty, of, uh, plenty of, of iron in the soil, it's just that the pH was high enough that it was limiting uh, the iron availability to the plant. So what we recommended, since the soil levels were good, pH was too high for blueberries, making iron less available, we recommended them to top dress with sulfur in the spring and fall so we can get that pH back down to 4.5. Okay, didn't, didn't recommend applying any, any uh, he ate, uh, he chelated um, iron products to this particular crop. I think I got one more here. Perennial strawberries. Okay, phosphorus was low, everything else was reasonably good, uh, but the leaf came back as normal, even though the soil levels were low. Okay, one thing I probably didn't mention, <laughs> um, unlike vegetable or annual crops, perennial crops can store nutrients within the roots, uh, within the, the, the stems, within the shoots, within the trunk, depending on what kind of plant it is, okay? So, um, because the plant looked good, again, it passed the eye test. The plants th that looked fine. It's like, well, what's going on? Well, we could only assume that um, it was drawing the reserves that were within the plant, you know, because the leaf came back uh, normal. So, again, since the plant health was good, the plant was probably using the reserve P um, within the plant. So, we did not say to apply any phosphorus at that particular time but that maybe next year when you do your next sampling that if 
things continue to be low, um, you may want to consider putting um, some, some not, not foliar phosphorus, but some, you know, when you do your fertilization, some, some uh, phosphorus granular fertilizer. So that was the end of the test. You all did spectacularly, so you will be able to, to leave today. And so in summary, again, we want to use both soil and leaf analysis to get a total picture. Okay, we only want to apply what's needed. Excessive applications can lead to a host of problems like we, talk, like we talked about. Understand the importance of the proper pH lever and understand what affects nutrient availability, which is what I was trying to show you with that exercise at the end, that drought can affect nutrient availability. Improper uh, sam leaf sampling time um, can, can give you a false, false reading of what's really going on in the plant. So it's kind of a... Um, uh, other things other than actually the, the nutrient being not there can cause you know, false readings on the uh, basilica. So anyway, um, I talked about, and again, you have in your, your folder the, the resources that I use. Well, it's, it's, they're great resources, but I, I drew heavily from them. Of course, the Penn State book and the Rutgers, they, they do a fantastic job of, um, for at least for, for tree fruits. Okay, for the, for, the, um, for the small fruits, I relied on the Mid-Atlantic Berry Guide. They have a great section in there about nutrients in small fruits. Um, I must admit, and it, it's hard for me to say because I am a University of Maryland employee, and, and we actually do a, a, we combine the book with Virginia and West Virginia. It does not have a very good nutrition section in, in the book. It, 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 it talks about it, 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 you know, but it's very limited. So, I mean, if you really want to do some good reading on that, the Penn State book or the Rutgers um, book are, are the ones that you want to uh, refer to for tree fruits. So with that, that is it.